Okay. So I'm very excited to have uh, here Colin. And um, I'd like uh, his research uh, because he tries to merge um, different fields, um, bioinformatics, psychiatry, medicine, and very few researchers do that and do that so well. Um, his uh, background is very unique in the sense that he graduated as a mechanical engineer yep. at, uh, 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 let me check my facts here, uh, Princeton University. Mm -hmm. And because one degree was not enough, he then went on and studied medicine at the University of Chicago. And then uh, got a chief uh, residency at uh, Columbia University Medical Center and was trained in data uh, science and machine learning mm -hmm. at the same institution. And in 2015, uh, the University of Vanderbilt was lucky enough to recruit him as an assistant professor, uh, where he is now um, using uh, data uh, analyst skills uh, to predict certain phenotypes with the overarching goal to improve health. I don't know if you yeah. would uh, agree with this Absolutely. goal. Um, he uh, collaborates with many researchers, um, especially with uh, PsycheMerge, which is how we met, uh, which focuses on using um, phenome and genome to improve psychiatric disorders. He has published his work at, at highly influential um, journals such as JAMA um, and other uh, influential journals in the field of biomedical research. And I'm very excited to have him here because I know that he's a great speaker. He's very witty. He's very enthusiastic. Only four days ago, I told him, do you want to give a talk? And then he immediately said yes, which shows a lot of his personality. So I, can, I can't wait to hear your talk today. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining me. And thank you for an absolutely a top three at least introduction. That was really kind. Thank you. So this um, came together quickly, as you all know. Um, the work I'm going to describe to you did not come together quickly. It's taken us quite a few years to get where we are. Always room for improvement, always room for interaction and discussion. So we have a nice, um, you know, nice comfortable group here. So if we all want to talk during the talk, I'm fine with that. Um, or I can sort of sail through and we have some, hopefully I have time for questions at the end. Um, so thank you again for the wonderful introduction. I do wear a few different hats and I bring a few different perspectives to my work. The last thing I'll say by way of introduction. So at Vanderbilt, my lab focuses on applied predictive modeling in mental and behavioral health. I'm an internist. I'm actually a primary care doc. So that's a good thing because a primary care doc, pretty much everything is my problem for my patients. And when we haven't treated mental and behavioral health overlay, nothing else we do is going to make a difference. That's my clinical experience. So I bring that to the, to the table. My experience as a biomedical informatician, and you'll see examples of this, means we're always designing to scale. So we're designing our algorithms to scale to the level of a hospital, to the level of a healthcare system, to the level of a network. And you'll hear about one today. Um, and then finally, I bring the perspective of an engineer, and that's a perspective where perfect is very often the enemy of good. So I have no relevant disclosures for today, um, but I want to share that with you. And my goals really are to provide, I'm going to structure this talk a couple of different ways. First, we're going to talk at the level of clinical prediction. And we're going to talk about how clinical predictive work is being used to think about something called decision support. How do we bring better data, better information to those who are making decisions at the point of care? I'm then going to talk about how we've converted our predictive machinery to become phenotyping machinery. And I'll talk about this in more detail, exactly what that means. And how do we do that at scale? And that's really important for efforts that you'll hear about, like PsychEmerge. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about how we think even bigger still. So how do we get beyond just even the phenotype to now the level of multi-site multi -site interactions and study to actually get to the power for really authority phenotypes? In the last hour, we were talking about tobacco use disorders, impulsivity in charge. How do you find that in a clinical record? Suicide is a space where I've spent a lot of my research. Suicide research is a really challenging problem. As tragic as that is, it's still relatively rare. So we often need to power up to population scale to find enough signal to train algorithms to do useful things. So start with some background. Um, I doubt that I have to explain to many people in this room that the burden of mental behavioral health disorders in America and really around the world is really staggering. So just take suicide, for example. 800,000 people around the world die from suicide every year. In the United States, it's 129 people every day. 129 Americans die from suicide every single day. That's up from one when I used to present that number a year ago, it was 123. That number's just gone up despite our best efforts. And those numbers have not changed equally for all people. So the reality is um, when we talk about one a phenotype like suicide, which is something that's very, I can describe that to you pretty quickly, when we, it doesn't take long to realize that under the hood, there's a lot of subtlety there. There's a lot of nuance there. There's a lot of paths that lead to one outcome that make it the common label on a clinical chart. 
And if we don't think about that, we're actually going to have our work cut out for us to try to understand that. Um, so prevalences of mental health disorders across the, in just in, in adults, for example, one in five people, which is really staggering. Rates in adolescence, a group in particular interest to us, continue to get worse. Um, and it gets, again, disparately gets worse across the board. Um, so nonetheless, problems like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, things we're studying in PsychEmerge, um, obviously have huge morbidity concerns, mortality concerns, not to mention things like personal and societal costs in treating those disorders. So fortunately, you know, we're living in a time when basically people are willing to collaborate in ways they never have before, and in spaces where it's typically been very difficult to do that, like mental health, for example. So there are biobanks that are focused in psychiatry and psychology um, around the world, frankly, that are allowing us to do studies that simply weren't possible 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so I mentioned just a couple of them here. So um, for example, we have the PGC, the Psychiatric TUS Consortium. Um, there's UK Biobank. You'll see a study where we use UKB. Um, and anybody familiar with these biobanks? Is this, am I preaching to folks who are familiar with this stuff or not? Nobody yet? OK, good. So I'll make sure I, I try to um, really give the background on this stuff as I go. Um, but what's exciting about these, you'll hear uh, UKB in a little more detail. Um, they're collecting data on broad swaths of the population, typically often through a voluntary means. People are willing to consent to do that, as well as provide blood, a blood sample, for example, to be able to run genetics on that. That's a really powerful thing. And it's only because we're talking about this stuff at the level that we are that now these, these kinds of things are taking off. On the clinical side, it's really exciting for me as a clinician. So clinical data is closely guarded, appropriately so. We're talking about high, you know, privacy concerns. We're talking about um, the potential for stigma, um, the potential for a lot of different potential issues as we combine data. And fear of breach is something that people like me worry quite a lot about. If data gets out there in the world and we don't want it to be, you know, this is some of the most intimate details of people's lives. Despite that, people are willing to partner on the clinical side in ways that was never, been, never done before. So the, the image I'm showing you is a mental health research network. So we're basically a, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'm just saying this for the first time right now, we're kind of on that secondary tier for MHIM. We're not formally at Vanderbilt members of the mental health research network, but they're doing such fantastic work and they're so collaborative. I've actually been on their calls for about the last year um, because they're doing such exciting work in the space that we're really interested in. And what they are, they're based out of the Kaiser Permanente system, um, not just Kaiser hospitals, it's 15 integrated healthcare systems that have actually functionally put it together such that they can run an algorithm across the scale of this, these systems pretty, pretty rapidly in ways that simply wasn't possible before. We're trying to replicate aspects of this through PsychEmerge and the eMERGE network, which has done this as well. Um, some of you may be familiar with something called Odyssey, which is an international consortium with the same idea, that you cannot even keep your clinical data, but with the push of a button, you can run a script because we've made a bunch of agreements out of the gate such that we can test an algorithm at Vanderbilt, and then we can instantly share it with all of our partners, and they can try it in their own sites. Imagine what that does for power when you're doing science in this domain. It's really powerful. So I like to highlight image right and the great work that they're doing, um, supported largely through the National Men Institutes of Mental Health. So some examples, and, in the, and a particular phenotype that's of interest to us these days, um, are being able to ask questions like, we, if we, even if we assume it's easy to find people with depression in a clinical health record, that's not actually trivial. Even if we can do that, can we find sub-phenotypes that are actually really important? Treatment resistance, for example. So those people, two patients, both of whom get an antidepressant, one of whom sails for 10 years on that same dose, the other tries and fails multiple medications, ends up getting hospitalized, ends up getting electroconvulsive therapy. Those are very different clinical trajectories. Can we phenotype that difference out of the gate? Can we predict that difference out of the gate? That's really important work. So I'm highlighting here some work by um, some of our collaborators. Roy Perlis is our uh, co-PI you'll hear about in a grant to come. Um, that we're working on now in this space, um, where basically they were using electronic health records to try to find that phenotype, just to find it and describe it using health records. It's a really powerful idea. What we're doing at Vanderbilt is really focusing on prediction, as I told you about, linked to omics, primarily genetics right now. Most of what you're going to hear about today is genetics, to really inform decision support and bringing these data, turning the data into knowledge, into action, is what we like to say. Um, and then more recently, even bringing in things like imaging and other novel data streams to try to solve really thorny problems in behavioral health. And I'll give you a little, I'll unpack those details for you now in a moment. I'm going to highlight a few of these papers. Um, this isn't the whole total body of work. This is focused largely in suicide. But this phenotype has one, we care about it. We're passionate about it clinically. We really want to prevent it, obviously, for all the obvious reasons. The significance is there. But at the same time, it's forced us to ask questions we never anticipated we have to ask when we started the work. So there's pure clinical prediction questions. There's clinical utility questions. There's questions around ethics we've had to deal with, with the idea that an algorithm can predict someone's downstream risk of suicide. If we believe that's true, we've now got ethical issues to worry about. I won't talk a lot about that one today. My point being here, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And then one of the ones I'm, I am going to highlight for this group is actually the genetics of suicide and what we're doing with that space. 
So we'll, fo we'll focus on prediction. So the idea and the, the fundamental goal in our lab and how we tend to work is we try to sit at the middle of this Venn diagram. This idea that applied predictive modeling allows us to find signal, hopefully with some time to intervene. So we make a prediction, let's say when someone has a primary care visit with me, and we have some window of time where we might be, have, be able to act. That's a fundamentally a clinical prediction problem. The counterpoint to that is classification, the idea that we take as much data as we can, except for the answer, and we try to understand, does somebody fall into this column or this column? To, to oversimplify, that's more of a phenotyping approach. And you hear about that in a minute. But we try to leverage scales in predictive modeling. And then really importantly, we have to couch them in ideas around implementation science and decision analysis. And I won't go into details on either of these right now, but understand that if we just focus in this circle, we're never actually going to translate to the point of care. That's going to be very, very difficult for us to do. Um, and you'll see some examples of the other two in a minute. And then decision analyses as well that grounds this work. I'm not presuming a lot. Oh, question? Yeah. Um, so as you get bigger and bigger, right, and um, you start getting data from, from these biobanks, I think you also get less and less control of, of what are the methods of these various collection yep. procedures. Yep. So how do you kind of validate that, and how do you incorporate that into, into the same model? I mean, what? Great question. So, so the first work you're going to hear about is one center, one cohort, a subset of the overall population just at one hospital. And already we have temporal issues that are a challenge. So care has changed over time, even at the same hospital. Data quality issues abound here. And it's really tempting to rush right to model. I was actually about to make this point. It's really tempting to rush right through and assume you've got good data, build an algorithm, and the garbage in, garbage out principle applies. When it comes to biobanks and sharing data, the problem is even more pronounced because now you've got disparate workflows, even by design. Like sometimes the data are different and they're supposed not supposed to be different because they're different, but they're different just because care is different becomes really, really difficult. So at the first level you're going to hear is where we go really deep at one center. And the second example, or maybe not the second exactly, but a, few, a, a subsequent example in the talk is be where we're actually starting to scale more across centers. So the way we get there, the simplest way I can tell you is one, to acknowledge that we've got that problem. Data quality is always a real challenge. And then being um, humble about what we're trying to get done and not presuming too much that are actually in the data. So we were, we were talking you know, in, the, before this talk about the idea that even finding folks with a, with a tobacco use disorder, for example, um, if you need a certain number of codes to sort of qualify as you have the thing that we care about, we have to understand there's a huge number of people who probably look a lot like that person who never actually get the code because we're using a surrogate for the, the ground truth which comes out of the health record. And that problem just scales when we go to new sites. So we have, we're by nowhere near uh, solving it. Partly how we get through trusting it is through validation, even for the whole data set, or for a subset of the data. And so I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And hopefully that will answer your question most succinctly. Mm -hmm. So we actually explicitly validate, usually through multi-expert review, to prove that, OK, if we're going to use this as a phenotype for the thing we really care about, that it works well enough in this sample that we're going to trust it. But what you lose there is there's confidence and there's some error you have to start to take into account. You can actually sometimes do that even statistically. You can say, look, we know that a presence of a code isn't 1. It's more like 0.6 or 0.8, that you actually have that problem, we actually try to account for that 0.8 when we run our analysis. Does that make some sense? It'll come up again. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, so for the, how, how do you deal with outliers in this, in this way? Because I'd assume there's more of a uh, guesswork in terms of was this a, uh, is this a meaningful outlier, or is this due to just uh, apathy to whatever experiment or give me an example of an outlier confusion. to make sure I speak to what you're well, thinking. I think I think there's outliers in the sense that there's natural variance, but then there's also outliers in terms of let's say it's a cognitive task, right? Yeah. Well, this participant could have just been confused, yep. or they could have just not cared, yep. right? And press random buttons. Yep. How do you um, gauge for that, right? Because you can't just take out outliers because they're outliers. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, so great question. So um, um, a few things that we're doing. One, as you'll see, I haven't said this to you yet, so why would you know? A lot of the work that we do relies on data that are collected for other reasons. So secondary use of electronic health record data. The idea that people are coming in, they're getting the care they get anyway. We've been doing that for 20 years at Vanderbilt. Now we've got a data set on 3 million lives, millions and millions of data points, and we try to make those data points useful. The idea that we would then additionally say we run a survey instrument or a test that would now generate its own distribution, and there are outliers within that, is even more subtle. The outliers we tend to see are things like, so for example, I was studying how often at our hospital someone might have gotten a particular rating scale, just through natural clinical care, and one that was done, in, depending on the setting you're in, every shift. One person had this done over 800 times. The vast, the mean and the median are nowhere near that, as you might imagine. So that's an outlier, but that may be an informative one. 
So you, you really do have to understand the workflows. In my work, you have to understand the workflows you're trying to model because we're doing it with secondary data. The one you're describing is challenging, but also for, for sometimes for a different reason. So understanding, almost like missing this, I'm using that analogy a little loosely, understanding why something's missing is really important before you decide you just throw statistics at it, because right. then you're typically going to throw the wrong ones at it. Yeah. Um, so understanding if there's some signal in those outliers. The other thing we're doing, what we're finding is those alg the algorithms we use are very sensitive to them. So we'll often the outlier may actually drive performance in a way that's not useful. Right. So what we'll try to do is even simple transforms, so log transforming a feature. Trying to, try to have a count be more of a representation that almost looks more normal, even though it's like may not be at the end of the day. Um, that actually helps quite a lot. So simple things like that actually help a lot. So um, we've done the raw count thing, and raw counts, the outliers are real, but they can totally drive performance in a way that's not useful. It doesn't scale past that end of one or two. And so I didn't realize we were doing like 3 million uh, um, subjects, but uh, they, they even would drive performance in something like that many people? Dependent entirely, uh, not entirely, but largely on the rarity of the outcome. Uh, okay. The outcome prevalence drives it more than the population size. Uh, does that make sense? That's almost always been true for us. And you'll see some examples. So great questions, though. Thank you so much. Um, good. So really quickly, I don't want to presume knowledge of how these sort of data scientific pipelines work. So I'm going to go through that briefly. First idea is you start, let me try this fun tool. It's nice. You start with your study design. And that's as important as in any science, right? It's easy to rush through. I've got data. I've got algorithms. I can run some code in R or Python. Let me build a model. Super tempting to do that. Because you can move in silico, so you're not collecting, you're not bringing people into a lab. You don't have to wait six months. It's all there. So you really have to take the time to ask. Actually, um, uh, my colleague over here and I, those questions he was asking are a lot of the questions you need to ask right out of the gate. Who's the cohort I actually care about? Who's actually at risk for the outcome I'm worried about? How do we define the outcome? I can take one ICD code, diagnostic code, and use that as the outcome. Is that good enough? Probably not in most examples. Do I need to pull something out of text to find this? Do I actually have a rigorous measure on that? Do I have the calipers I need? In our work, that's our concern. We've got the data, but do we have the right data? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. The second step is data extraction and cleaning. That's really making data amenable to computation. The third step is where we start to think through, OK, if we're going to predict an outcome we care about, let's take, uh, you know, let's take depression as our outcome for now. What do we think contributes to that? What swaths of clinical data or any types of data need to be relevant? What does the algorithm need to see to try to differentiate those patterns? How do we transform it? We just spoke about one of the transforms, you know, taking counts and making them something that doesn't throw a model off quite as much as a raw count might. And then the prediction and validation step. So actually training and running an algorithm to see, does it actually identify the thing I care about? And does it do that in some way with, with good performance? And then you iterate. And so iteration is, is intentionally not going back to any one particular box here, because it could be anywhere. Something, you often have to go right back to the drawing board. There are, I don't know if this version of the talk has it or not. I don't think it does. No, it doesn't. Um, what you might find, what is in, I mean, where do you all think we spend the most time in this type of work? Extraction. Number two. Number two is by far. So it's depending on which study. There actually have been studies looking at this. It's 60%, 80% of the time. If you ask people who do this a lot, they usually say it's more than 80% of the time. And which do people like the least? That's also been studied. And guess what? That second box is not the fun part. That's not what people enjoy doing. So if anyone's sitting here thinking, I would love to try this type of work, one of the things to know is a little bit you're going to be fighting the data. Once you've done that, those choices you've made, the lift comes because the marginal lift the next time is much smaller. It doesn't mean one approach solves all problems, but it often lets you hit the ground much faster than if you hadn't spent all that time in the beginning. So, yeah. Sorry, it's okay. It's good. Uh, with regard to, um, can you just go back to the last slide? Oh, sure. With, with data extraction and cleaning, um, is there some way that, that there could kind of be this movement forward that's um, like kind of this productive, uh, people creating these data sets that are very similar such that they can be combined? Yeah. Because yep. yep. it seems like that the amount of time that would be wasted, it just shouldn't. It should be not as big as it is if these are, you know, not raw data sets, right? So, the, so there's um, there's a couple of levels of it. On the, at the most basic level, I totally agree. And actually, so the great examples of that and what we're trying to do with our networks is even simple things like agreeing to a data model helps a lot. So we have agreed to stand up a particular, what's called a common data model, which means if we're going to have ICD codes, we're going to have medications, we're going to have um, even concepts from notes, for example. We can stand those up with respect to uh, a data model that defines those terms. And it's not perfect, but at least in such a way that you don't have to do that again. The reason that's powerful, and uh, what we're able to do is basically if we write a script that not just runs the algorithm, but also cleans up the data, we can share that too. So that allows us to speed up immeasurably. 
even doing that with sophisticated sites, and I have a couple examples of projects I'm doing right now with that, even then, it's easy to get sort of, you know, I thought we talked about it on this call and we did it slightly different than you did. There's still some level of sort of aggregating that. The common data model helps quite a lot. Um, and also, we're starting to see, um, you know, partly clinical data is noisy, messy, sparse, always, almost. Sometimes that's really important. You know, we don't necessarily want to smooth it all and make it too easy. But at the end of the day, the common data model is one huge step. And then um, some of the choices we make around scaling data that's very raw. We were talking about this a little bit with what do we do with ICD codes at the level of dimensionality, because there's 65,000 ICD-10 codes. Things we can do to sort of at least lump them down and make them easier to run with help tremendously. And we're starting to do those more at scale. So I'll give you an example of that in a second. So those kinds of strategies really do help a lot. But in the, begin in the beginning, it is really tough. It's like learning to ski. You know, in the beginning, there's going to be those falls as you just sort of figure out how to get off and going. Then eventually, we start to learn some techniques that allow us at least to move a little more quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll unpack actually a few of these ideas right now. So this is the first work I'll mention from SWEPS 2017, where we had the hypothesis that if we could identify people we thought would be at risk of a suicide attempt in the future, at a time when we might have some ability to interact, uh, interact with them and potentially focus prevention efforts, that might be a good thing. That's fundamentally what was driving this work. But we didn't know what we didn't know. My partners in this work are both suicide researchers who are um, experts in their field, know the literature better than just about anybody I've ever met, um, and have actually written some meta-analyses that were really important in its background for this particular work, showing that traditional clinical instruments don't work that well. So things like the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, things like the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, no one instrument, no one risk factor really solves this complex problem. I don't know that anybody thought that would be true, but they kind of did the meta to prove it. So we actually look not just at suicide attempts at any point in time, we look specifically at particular points in time. So we wanted to see what did the clinical data look like seven days before attempts, and how, how different was that as we went out as far even as two years before attempts. And there was different, there are different models, I'll tell you that. The samples look somewhat different, and do the risk factors differ? And it turns out they do. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on that part of it. I'm using this as an example of kind of how this approach can work. And even from 2017, we've already made a bunch of choices that are that we like to think are better now because we've learned a lot in doing this. But let me describe how we approach this problem, and it might answer some of the questions that I'm already getting, which are great questions. So the first is, what's the outcome we actually care about? Let's say suicide attempt. That seems like I can say that too quickly, and everybody might have an idea of what they think that means. I need to teach a computer to find that signal, which forces you to be very granular. Fuzziness can be tricky. It sometimes is a, is a, is a trait, it's a feature, but often it's something you really have to work through. <coughs> So we looked at suicide attempts, and the first thing we found that if we used what a lot of other papers had used, which were in, in, uh, diagnostic codes for self-injury in ICD version 9. Does everybody know what ICD codes are? Yeah? Everybody? I, I don't. You don't. Cool. So diagnostic codes are something, somebody sees me in, in primary care clinic, they have high blood pressure. I talk about that with them, I write about it, I may give them medication. After the visit, when I'm submitting a bill for that, I will apply a code to the chart. Hopefully, I apply one that describes hypertension, particular number code, structured code, that says hypertension. There are lots of them to choose from. They have lots of differences. There are thousands of papers that use them for various and sundry reasons. They can be highly problematic for all the reasons I just told you. I didn't do it to help a guy like me build a model. I did it because I'm billing something downstream. Codes can change over time. They can be inaccurate. If I screen for hypertension, do I code for hypertension, whether or not they have it? It gets very thorny very quickly. We looked at self-injury codes specifically from a particular version of ICD, and we looked how often do they actually describe a suicide attempt. To do that, we actually identified a candidate set of 7,798 charts that had ever had an ICD-9 self-injury code. My colleagues, God bless them, read every single one and validated whether or not that self-injury code showed evidence of suicidal intent with the self-injury. And intent was the key word there. I'll just finish this one sentence, I'll take your question. It turns out that in, at Vanderbilt, up until about 2017, 2016, an ICD-9 code alone for self-injury only showed evidence of suicidal intent 58% of the time, which means almost half the time that ICD-9 code wasn't going to be useful for the outcome we actually cared about. We had to do that by actually hand-reading every one of those charts. Right around the time of the code, we tried to make it easier for them, but you can imagine it took weeks, weeks to figure that out. And we can't necessarily scale that approach, but at least now we have some sense of what the positive predictive value of a diagnostic code might be in that era. That might be useful for other work. Um, but there are some challenges with that too, and you had a question, so I'll, let me take that first. Yeah, just yeah, following up with ICDs. Um, so it seems like there's like objectivity and subjectivity in this, right? Like if, you, if a patient has hypertension, you can pretty easily objectively say that's the case. Something with uh, depression, you're going off of, it's more subjective, right? We don't really have any objective way of gauging that. Um, and so that's like one question, how do you kind of bounce those? And then 
Um, these are patients that that didn't see the primary care doctor because they had committed suicide, yet how were their ICD codes that were lodged that recorded? That? In this case, anyone for any reason at all who got a self-injury code was in the group to start, for any reason at all. They might have seen the primary care doc yesterday. It might have been the primary care doc who coded the darn code. Uh -huh. We didn't subdivide it all out of the gate. We simply wanted to cast our net as widely as possible across the entire health, the repository of the health record to figure out everyone we could find at that time and I'll end the talk with an example of what we're doing now, which is more sophisticated, to try to say, we just want to find as many darn people as we can who might have had a suicide attempt at some point in time. Even then, it's really tricky, actually. And that's one thing to take home. Hypertension is not as easy as it might sound. And I'm not saying you said it's easy. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Hypertension sounds like it should be straightforward. We measure blood pressure, right? We can do things for that. But how many blood pressures does it take? If I come in and I just you know, broke my leg, my blood pressure is going to be high. You're just going to take one blood pressure on me and say I have hypertension? I may, may or may not be right. Maybe there's one diagnostic code. That may or may not be right. But, you know, so what people do in the work of uh, folks like Josh Denny and others who have done really nice work way right out of the gate is something called fee codes, these phenotypic codes, which might be a combination of, let's say, two diagnostic I'm making this up for hypertension because I haven't, that didn't come in with this in my back pocket. But the idea that you would need to have at least one or two blood pressure values out of whack and two diagnostic codes. And the combination of all those things gets you above a bar that at least says, okay, you probably have the thing we care about. Even then, we don't know for sure. Um, it's a tricky question. The other reason it's tricky is because it's confounded by the work that we're doing anyway. So we're treating hypertension, right? So we have a phenotype you'll hear about in a second, bipolar, where the medication is also used to phenotype the code, to find it, to say if you have bipolar and you also have your diagnostic codes and you have these meds, you're more likely to have bipolar because it's so subjective. So we try to make it more objective, and that's, the, that's one of the big points in the work, and that's one of the arts of the work. Um, but even when it seems straightforward, it's usually not. So um, again, perfect is the enemy of good, so it's okay. It doesn't mean you don't do it. It just means we should know that it's never going to be quite perfect. So some of the methods we've developed, you'll hear about in a second, um, essentially help us, help us take that into account. We like to think is what that does. And I'll, I'll try to, you can push back on me if you don't agree with me by the end of the talk if that's true. So even the outcome, I haven't even gotten past this bullet yet, and it's thorny, right? And that's just finding the thing we care about. Who do you compare that to? So that's actually much harder, frequently. Partly because of choice. You have so many choices of how you define your comparison group that you can drive yourself crazy, or you don't take enough time and you just build what you take one that's really, really biased in, in, at the end of the day. So you pick a group of controls that are too clean, for example, right? And where you can actually build an algorithm that looks like it works great, but it's not actually useful. And I can give you some examples of that. So the point being is here, you have choices. Your sample size is also something you could choose. If we have 3 million lives, we like to say we have that many lives in the, in the repository, and we do, but do we have good data on all 3 million of those people? Some of those people came to our center once, got a flu shot, and never came back. Should I be using those people to build a fancy model? Maybe, maybe not. If I'm building a model who's going to get a flu shot, even then it's probably not useful. So one of the things we did is we said, let's take 3,000 adults with confirmed by multi-expert review suicide attempts from their charts. And let's compare them just to 13,000 folks, and there's a lot of reasons we chose that particular number. Um, another a really important choice, what's, your other, what's the sample size of comparators? With at least three visits over six months. Which you could argue is, okay, where'd that come from? Other folks have done it in lots of other papers, but to, at the end of the day, it is still a choice, right? And we can tune any one of those numbers or do something else entirely. Or do we just take people who've had a diagnostic code for, or actually we took problem list here, um, who have some history of depression in their charts. We want to sort of smooth the surface and say, everyone has depression, that's our cohort. And now let's do a comparison. Or we look at those folks who've had other self-injury and do that comparison. Or only those people who are seen in a particular clinical setting. So the point being, it's meant to be a little bit confusing. All of these are choices we can make. And no one tells you at the end of the day which one's right. So if you remember the, the thing that you care about, what's the use case and what's the problem, it helps you at least constrain some of these choices. How we stand up predictors is a whole other set of choices, thousands of potential choices. Things that we chose to use were historical diagnostic codes prior to the thing we're trying to predict, medications that were documented prior to the thing we want to predict, where people touch our system, which ends up being important in just about every study we do. Are they seen in an emergency department or in a clinic, for example? Their demographics, age, race, and sex. You know they don't have gender here. We do not do that well in electronic health records. And then th when we care about things like socioeconomics, for example, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're often using surrogates for that, which is, again, an imperfect proxy for truth to give us some, insight, some sense of what else might be happening outside what we, what we record for clinical use. So we use something called the Area Deprivation Index, which maps the zip code, which is a one-number surrogate. We didn't invent it. We're uh, beneficiaries of it. It's a research tool out of Wisconsin that uses census indicators and things like poverty levels, how many people own a car, how many people own a house. All those things map to the level of zip code, which is not person. 
a zip code, that gives us some sense of that community. Then you'll see that comes up again in the talk. Then, I won't get buried in the nitty gritty here, um, but the idea is that fundamentally what we try to do is we take those individuals with the predictors I just told you about, with labeled outcomes that we care about, whether you had or didn't have the outcome, we train an algorithm where it gets to see everything. We don't just train one, we train a whole set of them. Sometimes we train ensembles of them where we combine the output of each one. And then we test it. We say, okay, in the data you haven't necessarily seen, there's a million, there's a few, not a million, there's a few ways to do this that are much more subtle than this. I'm not going to go into them for sake of time. This is one of the most simple setups, a holdout type set, where we have training and test and we keep them apart. But you build out the algorithm, you test it with predicted labels and known outcomes, and you say, okay, how do we do? And then you go back and you do it again. Um, and there's lots of flavors here. The talk is not about that, so I'm not going into the details. But broadly speaking, that's what we do and other groups do as well. We partly pick different algorithms because often they require different assumptions. Sometimes the math works a little bit differently. Sometimes we get different insights out of them depending on how that works. There's also a trade-off between how readily interpretable they are versus how uninterpretable they might be and their performance. Um, I'm going to leave out deep learning, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. I'm not particularly a subscriber of the statistics versus machine learning thing. I don't find it that productive. The key is that algorithms give you different insights and frequently combinations are useful. And we can't get around the fact that people still do care about interpretability. If you were to just break down like the logistic progression, what, what are your um, explanatory variables and what's, what's your dependent variable? Like whether or not there's been a suicide attempt, is it one or a zero? Or? So in the example I gave you, the uh, dependent variable is, uh, let's say, 30 days. A zero or a one for you had the attempt based on two expert review or not. And we look back 30 days from then, so we censor out that period of time. That's a prediction window where we don't include input data. And then our, our independent variables are things like counts of um, ICD codes mapped up to an aggregator that we quite like, we didn't invent. So, so all the codes for depression get mapped up to depression, all the codes for hypertension to hypertension, and we represent the counts. And sometimes we do transforms on those counts. And then um, there are a couple of variables that are binary, but most of them are, are weighted a little bit with frequency. So in our logistic regression, that's how it works. The one thing we haven't done so because we have, even with some of our dimensionality reduction, which I glossed over for purposes of time, we have 1,500 predictors in one of our first studies, which is still a lot. So we had tested non-penalized regression, just straight logistic regression, but much more frequently we're using things like the lasso, the ridge, the elastic net, um, partly because the, just the interaction terms and the order is really complicated. So we found a lot of value in using penalized regression to help us through some of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, is something like PCA valuable at all? Yeah, yeah, great question. So we're, we're, so we are doing PCA more. So on the genetic side, we're absolutely doing a lot of PCA. On the clinical side, we're starting to. We didn't start there, um, partly because we knew the interpretability then immediately was going to be really challenging. And we know with our clinical providers, there's a lot of appetite to say, okay, if that's fine, you put the model, but how does it work? Tell me what the predictors are. That's a trade-off, right? And so as we're building trust, we hope we're building trust with these approaches. We hope we can do less of that and just be way more just trust us it's going to work. Because as we get down to stuff like this, as our data sets get bigger and bigger, it's going to be very tough to kind of unpack how that works. So the explainability and interpretability things end up being important. So that's just one particular example. And you'll see a couple we'll come back to. Um, as far as performance, I won't go into great detail here. One of the things we care about is discrimination. Can we tell the zeros and the ones apart in the future? Can we say who's going to likely to have this and who isn't? We also care a lot about calibration. That's if I say somebody has a 20% risk of something, does two out of 10 people who look like that person actually have it? Also really important for decision making as well as model accuracy. Also really important for genetics. Um, and then we also care about precision, especially because suicide tends to be relatively rare. We, we a priori, and not a priori, but we basically empirically set a prevalence in one of our early studies where we said we'll take 3,000 cases and 14,000 controls. So we set a prevalence which is, can be good for discrimination, but can be really bad for calibration, can be good for precision, but then doesn't scale. And precision is positive predictive value. I should be explicit about that. Which, if you're doing suicide prevention, for example, how many people need to get screened to find that person who actually is going to have the outcome? Which can get very expensive, or you've got the needle in a haystack problem. That becomes really, really tough. So let's say, let's, if you would give me the fact that we think we've got some progress here, we think these models potentially can scale. We're using only structured data. I should be explicit about that. We're taking data that any hospital that has an electronic health record has, by design, structured only, no text yet, and we think they work OK. What the heck do we do with them? Do we just give them to people and say, go for it? It's actually really, really hard. So if machines, you know, so the, 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 oh yeah, please. Yeah, so we rely on the quality of our outcome, our dependent variable, to say we've captured intent. So out of the ICD-9 codes that had self-injury, because we specifically found the ones that had showed evidence of suicidal intent, 
What we're finding is the likelihood that you would have that. That's as close as we can come. Because intention is really hard. Just like impulsivity and those things are really hard. Does that make sense? So we're giving it a lot of credit. And I'll be the first to tell you that. But the idea is at least we're not finding just a self-injury code, which is a little bit different. Um, so again, at the end of the day, all models are wrong or some are useful or something we do live by because it's always true. But again, that utility is really what's key. So let me talk about that really briefly. So the next thing we did, we wanted to replicate. We wanted to make these models useful by understanding clinical process. If we build a predictive algorithm and we can turn it on, that's the easy part. Who do we give it to and what do we do with it, right? And if we get to the center of this, uh, this Venn, we're hoping that's where the impact might live. So let me talk about this for a second. First thing we do is replication. Same machinery I told you about with some improvements. I'm going to skip for the sake of time. And we compared our approach in adolescents versus adults. The first thing we found, and not every group agrees with us on this, one model did not fit all. The model that worked for adults who were over 18 was not as good as a model trained specifically on adolescents. It actually failed pretty badly. So we ended up refitting and retraining a model on adolescents. Two things that popped out that surprised us. Things like attention deficit disorders were really important in our lesson. I'm saying important because we're using random FAR, so it's, that doesn't have a test statistic like logistic regression does. So I'm not saying it's protective risk factor or whatever. We've done, you'll hear about a study in a second where we did that. But attention deficit disorder is really important, didn't show up here. Environment, that area deprivation I told you about, even more important for adolescents than it was for adults. Which again, one model probably will not fit all. It certainly won't in our center. Um, whereas we, when we looked at adults, things like PTSD stood out a little bit more, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other comorbid illness. Because as people get older, they tend to have more polymorbidity. That ended up being a lot more for, important for prediction. Um, my partners in this are Joe and Jess. You've seen their names a couple times already. So Joe Franklin and Jess Ribeiro, currently at Florida State, um, have been my longtime partners in a lot of this work. So the next thing we thought to do is, well, can we open up that black box a little bit? So we took our approach. We applied it specifically to a population who all shared a particular comorbidity called fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndrome. None of these people was used in training that initial algorithm that I told you about. We apply that algorithm out of the box on this population, same data preprocessing pipeline I told you about. You have to trust me, the performance was reasonably good for what we were shooting for. The discrimination had an AC around 0.8, calibration was okay, the metrics were all pretty good. But what we tried to do here was say, can we actually explain how we're getting some of these answers to somebody, to somebody to, in some way that would be informative to um, my colleague here, Lindsay McKernan, who's a clinical psychologist. Um, Leslie Crawford is a rheumatologist who's an expert in fibromyalgia. And uh, Lindsay treats a lot of these patients for, uh, for mental health and mental illness in, the, in her clinic. And Matt Lennox, a PhD in my lab, who helped in this work. So can we unpack essentially how this works? So um, I'm glossed over the details for purposes of this particular talk, but we took a variant of penalized regression called the Bow Lasso, which is a bootstrap uh, application of the Lasso, essentially really rigorously selects features. And at the very end, we get a test statistic that looks a lot like a logistic regression test statistic does. So it combines some of the rigor that we like out of the Lasso, but also lets us get an output that's somewhat interpretable to a, somebody like me in my primary care job. And one of the things we saw was in fibro specifically, which is a population rich for depression as well as suicidality, protective factors. So those test statistics suggested that these people were lower likelihood to have uh, an outcome of suicide attempt downstream, tended to have uh, those signs that look like lots of medications as well as clinical visits, typical of the outpatient clinic setting with a primary care doc, a mental health specialist, a rheumatologist, for example, seemed to be lower downstream risk for suicidality. So what we did was we tried to estimate just how different those populations were. Like it was really striking in this particular population more so than others. So we did a time-based, what I mean by time-based utilization analysis, it was actually quantified, we estimated how much time in clinic were these populations spending. The person with fibromyalgia who goes on to have a suicide attempt, for every hour that they spend in clinic, how much was the counterpart, the person with fibromyalgia who does not end up having a suicide attempt spending in clinic? So for every hour, the person who has the attempt is spending in clinic in one year, the person who never has the attempt is spending 50. They're in clinic like vastly more than the counterpart who doesn't. Now this is not causation, this is correlation. But at the end of the day, what we, th what we took from this is what other groups have found as well. Those people who seem to be heavily engaged in an outpatient setting seem to be lower risk for something that we care about. Again, it's not causation. But one of the things we found, and the reason I highlighted is other groups in the country are working on this too, simply finding those folks who may not have that relationship, we may be doing some good there. So connecting the dots and finding folks who, as it's been said, can be falling through the cracks can be really valuable time. So that's something that we took from it. Um, in the interest of time, I'll move pretty quickly because what we've been doing more recently is trying to actually turn these things on in production, in clinical production. So um, thanks to a grant we received at, at Vanderbilt not that, uh, last year, 
Um, that's catalyzed our work in this great team here. I won't mention everybody specifically, but these are some of the folks on my team at Vanderbilt. What we've been doing is taking a research grade tool and actually we've turned it on in production silently. So we're not giving it to anybody. We want to test and see, is it even working? Do we even get the same answer that we would have gotten in the lab in production? Which may, for those of you who are further from the clinical space, then it may not seem like a big deal, but it can actually be a bigger deal than you think. So using clinical production data streams to inform one of these models is very different than taking a lab setting where you already kind of know everything that's happened. You've got it in your data set. So we're doing that now. The other thing we're doing is understanding clinical process and who we're going to give this information to. We do that by getting people in a room. Forget quantitation, forget code. This is people talking to each other about the problems they face in real world suicide prevention workflow. So we got about 25 people in this particular room and sat there and sat there and we didn't talk about AI or machine learning or any of that once. We said, tell us about what's making your life hard right now. Things like when I discharge somebody, I have no idea where they go. I don't know if they follow up. I don't know what happens to them. Things like, well, I feel like a lot of people are getting good screening when they come to our emergency department, but I think other people are not and they're also at risk and they don't know how to help tease those people apart. How do you scale that? Really hard. So we get people in the room, we ask. We also, if you're interested in this type of work, you get championship. This is the CEO of the psychiatric hospital at Vanderbilt who introduced the DART session. He's been a champion for us because he knows he cares about this work too and that helps get people motivated to help these things. So championship's really important. Partnership is really important. It's also iterative. And you have to work through these steps. You have to understand what's important. One of the things people care a lot about is safety. If I'm going to turn on an algorithm in an emergency department or wherever, can you prove to me that it's at least safe? That I'm not going to identify somebody or tell somebody to do a thing that hurts somebody downstream? In suicide, you can imagine, it's in suicide prevention, I should say, you can imagine it's easy to be wrong in either direction and they both matter a lot. If I say someone, if an algorithm says that's first low risk and they go on the next week and there's a suicide attempt, that's a huge factor. We care about that one a little bit more, a lot more actually. But in the other, uh, in the other example too, if you're flagging a lot of folks as a positive and none of them ever go on to have the disorder, that's also a challenge because you're, it's fighting your scale. So all of these steps end up being really darn important. And where we are now is really trying to say, okay, how are we going to study this with respect to the clinical process gaps we've identified, which is very thorny and very slow work. And it's very iterative and highly collaborative. So I want to really triple underline that because none of this happens. If we just do it in my lab, it doesn't go anywhere. Oh, goodness. Um, last couple things on this, and then I want to spend as much time as possible on the phenotyping side, but everything preparatory to this really sets us up to move quickly through that. Um, testing this in the military with the U.S. Navy, as well as testing this with a population, specifically in adolescents, 15 to, 12, 15 to 24 young adults, in the Native American population in the Southwest, particularly high risk for this kind of stuff. So once you move out of the walls of Vanderbilt University, it, you have to be really open to ways to improve the process. And knowing that if you're delivering care in this setting, and you say, let's run a random forest, you don't have, we don't have a mechanism to run that in, on the fly in the field where people actually live. So the pragmatism helps us constrain exactly what we're doing. I won't talk more about that today, but just know that it's really easy to test your initial assumptions as you get closer to translation. So let's focus on phenotyping. So this one I want to make sure we have some time to talk about. And this is the one we were talking about. So it's predicated in the idea that, okay, we've got clinical algorithms. We think identify risk of something that we care about. There's also this question of genetic liability. And so this, this is taken from a paper from the PGC, the Psychiatric uh, GLAS Consortium, in 2014. The idea that there's not just one gene that solves your problem, there's many genes that may contribute. Just like there's many clinical risk factors that when you put them all together, help you get a better picture of the profile of risk. So Doug Rudifer, Vanderbilt, is a wonderful collaborator, a long-time collaborator and co-PI with me on a couple of things. Manny Rivas at Stanford, um, who we're also working with um, very specifically in this space. We partnered in this work to say, we were really interested in where's the interplay between clinical predicted risk as well as genetically mediated risk. That was fundamental that we wanted to test. So to do that, we took two cohorts that were independent of each other and we compared them and I'll explain how. UK Biobank is out of the United Kingdom. It's around half a million adults, 40 to 69. It's actually more like 37 to 73. So different than Vanderbilt, where it's pretty much anybody who walks in the door any age. Um, patient reported outcomes. So remember I told you we did a big chart review exercise looking at dissect diagnostic codes and then reading notes. In UKB, we had the benefit of a really good question, patient reported. Patients were asked at intake in a survey, have you ever harmed yourself with the intention of taking your life? Intention was the key word. We wouldn't have bothered if we didn't at least have that word. At Vanderbilt, everything I just told you about was what we did. We had clinically predicted risk, we had clinically reported outcomes documented by somebody, and around 200,000 people who had a very different age range than UKB. And the question we asked, if we take uh, if we take, uh, actually, 
I don't actually think I have it. At UKB, we had 135,000 people in the study. 2,000 or so had reported that they had a suicide attempt defined by this phenotype, this, this, this question. A polygenic risk score is derived. The one was, I said yes to that question, the zeros were the 133,000 people that didn't. So imagine, I took a logistic regression and I built out a regression model that does that. I take that score, which uses genetics as the independent variables, and I apply it at Vanderbilt. So now in genetics, in our BioView sample with biobank data, polygenic risk is applied to that population with a score derived in the UK. Following so far? And the first question we asked was if we compare that polygenic risk profile, and that's not exactly, well, that's, this is the number of gene type people, and then a clinically predicted risk. We take the polygenic risk score, and we, call, we see, does it correlate with clinically predicted risk using EHR data, that's our method. And it turns out that it does. So genetically mediated risk from a polygenic risk score at the United Kingdom correlated beyond chance with clinically predicted risk using EHR data at Vanderbilt. Now we thought that was pretty interesting. Please. Uh, polygenic, is that an aggregate score of race? And so what, what is that comprised? What comprises that? Uh, well, so, so exactly what you just said. So it's an aggregate score across the across the profile, basically. Uh -huh. um, so taking your um, the, just the the variants that essentially contribute to that risk score, the zero and one, those independent variables essentially contribute to that risk. So it's LD score regression, with a regression score being the glue, uh -huh. and that we applied that same regression model at Vanderbilt on the underlying genetics, and then correlated that with our clinically predicted risk. But polygenic is are those like biomarkers that are creating that, or what 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 creates the polygenic aggregate score? As in which specific genes, or uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, what is that like? So essentially, the yeah, the genetic the, the genetic analyses that are run at BioView, which is the same thing that are run at UKB, those become the inputs for that polygenic score. So that's essentially what it is. That's what mediates that actual risk. So the genetic liability is what we thought we were, we were interested in finding, and we looked to see whether that genetic liability correlated beyond chance with clinical liability. Okay. It turns out that it does. Does that make sense? That's the key idea here. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's the key idea. Uh, the, so the heritability was 4%, which I say to you here, I'm trying to remember what the RG was. I can't remember off the top of my head what the number was, but I'll make sure you get this one before you go. So because there's a key idea is this. The other key idea in this paper is not just that polygenic risk correlates with clinical risk. It's that we can take a 0 or 1 phenotype and create a distribution of risk. That's the other key idea, and that's what we were chatting about. This idea that I'm not just using 0 or 1s to define the likelihood of a thing, everybody gets a fraction of a score. And that fraction can effectively increase your sample size. That's the idea that I was trying to convey earlier. And what that allows you to do effectively says, in this population at Vanderbilt, we had 24,000 people with high quality genetics. Only 73, 73 of 24,000 had that zero or one, if we did it the old fashioned way. But by applying the algorithm to essentially paint a distribution of risk, the effective sample size has been increased. Because not everybody gets above the bar to get that particular phenotype that we defined for some of the reasons we were talking about earlier in the talk. So that's functionally the big idea. All 24,000 were fair game for these analyses, as opposed to if we did it the old-fashioned way, 73 would have been fair game. And we would have had no shot to actually run the study. What we found from this is not just the fact there's a heritability signal around 4%, but you also get, you basically get uh, risk factors that we could validate from external, from other GWAS that were done at other studies. We can actually apply those statistics here and show that in our sample as well, one, they correlate across both samples. So we kind of are believing we're finding something real here, um, as well as you get some estimate of the, the relative risk of these things being present. So depressive symptoms, sleep disordered symptoms from two different studies, uh, depression again, neuroticism, schizophrenia, as well as things like age at first birth. Lower age at first birth seemed to be correlated with higher risk, which we thought was an unusual finding. So we talked to our obstetrician colleagues who said that peripartum depression in young mothers is something they worry a ton about. So there was some clinical face validity to that. But the idea was intriguing enough that we wanted to essentially test it further. We partnered on this particular work, which takes that very same idea um, with Roy Purvis at MGH to now study treatment resistance in depression. Highly correlated, as you might imagine, with suicidality. Treatment resistant depression, around 30% of people with that can have suicide attempts lifetime, which is a really high number. One out of three lifetime risk of suicide attempt and treatment resistant depression. We, believe, we convinced ourselves that these quantitative phenotypes can, increase our, can effectively increase our study power so we sought to replicate in, in TID and in, in schizophrenia as well. In the interest of time, I'm going to move more quickly. We kept a lot of the machinery the same. We now had a new, core, new cohort and a new outcome. We had people with depression who had some uh, definition that we had to convince ourselves was a surrogate for treatment resistance. Treatment resistance is easy to say, hard to define. 
So we took a surrogate for that, a fairly extreme example of that phenotype, which are people who end up getting electroconvulsive therapy. People with depression who end up getting that treatment often have, tr have depression that's not responded to a number of first, second, or even third line treatments. We can find ECT pretty easily. It is an imperfect surrogate for what we actually care about, but all of the steps that I told you about before still kind of apply here. So the first thing that we did was we found 600 cases of people who got ECT who had a diagnosis of depression. We had around 50,000 people who just had depression without that. So those were our comparators, defined by that clinical cohort of depression. We can build out algorithms that seem to tell those zeros from those ones pretty well. And we apply the same approach. We can quantitate the phenotype. So everyone with depression gets some fraction of a likelihood that they're going to be treatment resistant. Some people are right at the bottom. Some people are 0.8 or 0.9. What we did here is we picked up that approach and we sent it to our colleagues at MGH to externally validate it. And so one of the things to remember here is when you can test in a completely independent sample, it kind of stands to reason, it's intuitive, you've got a much more rigorous test. The other thing we did, and I mentioned this to you as well, is this idea that when you can, if you can convince yourself that this predicts something else that you care about, you can believe it a little bit more. Because at the end of the day, you've got these posterior probabilities of stuff, of something that you might care about, and you want to convince yourself that it predicts something real. So what we did in this case is we looked for those people for various and sundry reasons, might have gotten a consultation for electroconvulsive therapy, but never actually gotten ECT for a lot of reasons. But the people who got that consultation, which was not used at all in training the model, seemed to be more likely, we would think they'd be more likely to be treatment resistant. And so it turns out that in the algorithm trained to find ECT, we were three times more likely to find people who got that consultation in the highest, risk predict in the highest predicted risk quintile. So what I mean by that is this algorithm seemed to find, in a pretty, as, as you can see, it sort of steps up here, this idea that we're finding those other folks who are in the clinical workflow of treatment resistance without actually getting the final phenotype that we were predicting. That makes sense. So when you can do that, it can be useful. This was pre-in data for a grant that we've since, uh, that we've since received that's now uh, functionally in this space. We're scaling out this approach and trying to build better models to actually predict treatment resistance. And now we're doing that in order to study the genetic liability of that exact disorder. So, briefly, we'll talk about psychomerge, which is the idea that we're taking the same idea that I was describing to you, and now we're taking three different centers that in a, in a big way are trying to build out clinical phenotypes to inform genetics, and that's actually how we connect it. So um, Jordan uh, Smaller on the left and Leah Davis on the right at Vanderbilt and Jordan's at MGH are the PIs on this particular grant. Obviously, I'm, I'm with joining it at Vanderbilt. And essentially what we're doing is defining a phenotype together all the same choices I described to you have to be made, but now across three different sites. And actually, since I, I put these sites together, it's actually more like four sites and five sites. Um, and then we have to test these things together. So going back to the very beginning of the talk, we have to agree on a phenotype. So even something saying something like bipolar, easy to say, hard to define. Things like diagnostic codes as well as medications contribute to that phenotype. There are frequently control definitions, which often can be actually quite tricky as well. Um, and it's easy to get trapped in sort of some of those choices, because you realize that the phenotype that was published may not be perfect for the task at hand. Um, so we've had to sort of think through that. We're taking a lot of the same features I've told you about previously. So some minimum number of touches with our healthcare system. Candidate features not that different than what you heard about before. And what we're doing um, is basically uh, mapping down doing some dimensionality reduction. But what's interesting about this, I'm rushing through here, is that we're doing a round robin. So if we take Vanderbilt data, the Vanderbilt phenotype, develop an algorithm. We can send it to our friends at Partners and our friends at Geisinger, and they're doing the same thing with two different algorithms at two different sites, different from ours. And we're essentially sharing to try to understand, is there one particular one that seems to be most generalizable that works the best in a broad swath of the population? Or perhaps there's some combination of these that's going to be really important. But this fundamental machinery relies on everything we were talking about. So we are having conversations now, you know, out of the box, having a common data model of all three sites. That's actually tricky, so we're, we're working on that now. Um, agreeing on a set of transforms that every site can do independently, because we're not sharing data here, we're sharing algorithms. That's actually really important. So the, the coefficient weights around the algorithms, around the predictors are what we're actually sharing, as opposed to actual data, which is somewhat not palatable. So that's what we're focused on. Um, but the idea is, as a new phenotype gets generated, something else somebody cares about, how do we most quickly get this into this exact pipeline? So that's what we're doing now. We're in the, sort of the building year, just started. Um, but this is work we're particularly excited about, because the effective sample size now you know, now it's not quite threefold. It's a little bit different than that because of the scale of the sites, but allows us to test some questions that before simply weren't possible because we didn't have enough cases. So where we are with this is we've done internal validation, actually two rounds of it. That means development of the algorithm at, at the home site, and we've done some external validation as well, and we're still finding ways we need to improve. 
So things like precision and calibration end up being positive predictive value and calibration end up being really important here. Um, so what this has taught us, well, well, there's a lot of questions that remain. So briefly, cause is something we care a lot about but rarely get to, right? That's really hard. These are still correlative statistics. How we handle time is really challenging. The fact that low positive predictive value for rare events is a really big problem in this work. How do we share data, not just algorithms, in a privacy-preserving way? And how do we build something that's actually generalizable? And there's a trade-off between the utility at, a, at one particular institution and its generalizability around the world. There are clinical effectiveness questions that are hard for us. How do we best engage patients? I mean, we're not leveraging that in a lot of the things that we actually really care about. So, um, you know, we've heard from people in the space of suicide prevention, survivors of those, so family members of those who were are, who are lost to suicide, actually have really important insights that we're just not doing a good job of collecting right now. Um, turning that prediction into prevention and then avoiding stigma. So when an algorithm can label a thing that in the, in the past has been stigmatized, we need to be really careful about how that gets done. Um, and I can talk more about that, but in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap. Um, We've thought, and I won't go into it, in terms of how we could actually share data across privacy-preserving lines. Again, particularly interesting was when we started writing papers with ethicists because we realized that an algorithm could recommend something, and if we're not careful, the most extreme, one of the most extreme treatments for suicidality is involuntary hospitalization. That's a really big deal. If a computer is telling you somebody's so high risk, you need to take away their freedom. So we want to be really careful about that. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we've convinced ourselves that some, some aspects of these methods can develop scalable models that, some, that are somewhat robust. And we, we leverage the fact that people are partnering in ways that were simply un unprecedented in the past. And PsychEmerge is actually a great example of that. Um, but we've talked about some of the limitations already. Lots of biases in the choices we've made. We're relying on, we published an algorithm in 2017. Does that mean it works really well in 2020? That may or may not be true. Um, and we rely on the fact that we're really heavily supervised in our approach that we're relying on data that we've already collected, which is great because we already have it, but it's bad because there's a lot of nuance that's going to be missing. Um, last thing I'll say is that Friday, and I told you about this already, um, we already realized our ascertainment problems were so bad that we needed to actually implement natural language processing to better capture things like suicidality and medical charts. So we just found out about a grant on Friday that is going to essentially catalyze that work. Because what we realized was that Lifetime prevalence of suicide attempt is so much greater than we even found through the approach I already told you about. When we looked for self-injury codes, we were missing large numbers, probably thousands of cases of lifetime attempt that were actually being misclassified as controls in our initial study. So we're hoping through text mining techniques we're going to be able to find those people to effectively increase our sample size, but also even better crystallize our outcome. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I took you a little bit over and I apologize. Lots of people to, set, to thank. Um, and lots of funding sources to thank as well. I'm happy to take any questions if people want to stay after. And thank you so much for joining me on a, on a busy holiday week. Questions? I, I apologize. I just, sorry, I just missed it at the end. The psych emerge is to find the bipolar phenotype and treat them differently than people with treatment-resistant depression? Or? So the, um, the goal here in general is to increase our sample size to study genetic factors that, that contribute to bipolar. So we want to understand the genetic liability of bipolar, and we use the clinical phenotypes to power it. So we want to build the best clinical phenotype possible by partnering with three different centers, or now four, actually. So that's, that's the fundamental crux. And Paul, pardon me for not making that really clear. So that's what we're hoping to power. But most, many of us on that project are actually clinicians. So we're always looking for ways those things are clinically useful, but that's actually a really hard question. So even in suicidality, we study genetic liability of suicide risk, but in our, in our analyses that follow where we tried to show adding that to a clinical model that has that, literally a thousand features that are all pretty, pretty, really predictive for the thing we care about, and adding just that genetic risk score, it doesn't move the needle in a very significant way. So we're trying to understand exactly when that's most useful. So we're trying to get ahead of ourselves. We do care about clinical utility, but in the beginning, it's understanding those genetic factors that contribute to risk. Um, Thank you for the question. Maybe a broad question, hard to answer. Um, with those genetic correlations, sometimes they compare minimal phenotyping to well-characterized uh, clinical diagnosis um, by a psychiatrist. You must find that genetic correlations are very high. Yeah. So you're building models with uh, thousands of features, and then you have this simple question that seemingly performs well. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so we, um, we, you know, a lot of what we worry about is, is that the bias variance trade-off is something we talk about a lot when we build out any model. Um, and that one of the things we have to be really cognizant of is the bias of who's even in the sample and at what level in the sample they are in our clinical data. So there's the 3 million at Vanderbilt. 
then there's probably a million that have enough data to do vaguely interesting things. Within that million, there's actually subsets. So when you get down to the, the people with genotyping, you know, we're still under 100,000, and that's a, that's a big number for genotyping. We're still under that. Um, but each one, at each step of the way, there's a sampling bias that sort of sends it off. So one of the things we worry about, we're testing clinically, uh, basically even clinically useful models or, or polygenic risk models, and we're essentially saying how well do they correlate when they should or when they shouldn't. And sometimes we find things look like they correlate when it doesn't make any sense as to why they would. And what we worry about is there's some artifact of clinical data. The fact that frequency of touches to a medical center contribute a lot to how these models work, but we're then we're just selecting for people who show up, which is not actually clinically useful to us. So like, I don't need to predict if you're going to come to Vanderbilt. That's not something that's important to me. But that's some non-zero part of their performance. So I don't know if that gets to the crux of your question, but that's some of the things we worry about as far as that work. Um, it doesn't mean you don't do it, obviously. right? We still think there's enough that you might learn, but just to know that those are the confounders. It gets in your way. Um, yeah. Any other questions? What's the... It's for the people next time. <laughs> I don't think you want to hear me. Uh, what's, what's the um, population that would go to Vanderbilt, right? Like, is it, what's yeah. the socioeconomic background? And Because I'd imagine there's, you know, I know where I used to live in San Francisco. I mean, you know, not everyone goes to UCSF. And yes, gathering data at UCSF is, is somewhat problematic. But Great question. So um, Nashville's a very health care dense town. So there are multiple very large health systems. So healthcare biz, really in fact, healthcare and music. Healthcare is number one. It's the biggest business in town. Music is number two. It's what Nashville is known for, but healthcare is bigger. HCA is at the Healthcare Corporation of America. That is 170 hospitals, something like that. Um, Tenant, there are really big healthcare centers all there. So people are in a very healthcare dense place. They can come to Vanderbilt, what frequently happens. So um, 80 plus percent Caucasian. Uh, Various mix of so those urban and rural population, and their risk factors are very different for some of the things we're talking about. Substance use as well, very different. We've recently, because the problem can be so difficult to understand, one of the, one of the aspects of it is where do they go for their care? So I have a lot of patients who'll see me in primary care, and then they may see a mental health specialist in another center. And I don't have data on that. I don't have optics on that. So I just don't know that they do it. Even if I know clinically, I can't, I can't show that to a model. So we actually recently had a, a contract with the state, started about a month ago where we're starting to study statewide patterns of risk. We're studying vital statistics at the state level. We're studying um, the prescription drug monitoring program at the state level, as well as discharge data at the state level to try to understand exactly that problem. So the demographics are variable. Like I, I told you, some of the broad swaths of it. Um, it's a fairly even split man, uh, man, uh, man and women. Um, but at the end, and again, gender is hard, so we don't do that as well as we want. Um, but then at the end of the day, um, a lot of the day, there's big gaps. And the problem with clinical data is you frequently don't know if that gap is because it didn't happen or because it happened someplace else. So we're starting to understand that with the state, but we just started uh, because it's such a big problem. Right. So. Can you work with health insurance companies to identify where else these people are visiting? Great question. We absolutely could. We don't have that partnership right now. We absolutely theoretically could. So the closest we would have, so Vanderbilt has a health plan, for example. Those people are different from the, the average Vanderbilt patient for a lot of reasons, sure. um, where we have claims. But some of the most powerful studies are exactly those. So partly why the Mental Health Research Network is so darn cool, they actually have their payers as well as billers of care. So they actually, for most of their patients, they're providing the insurance as well as providing the care. So they can do really cool things at scale. It's probably why I like to highlight their work for that exact reason. Um, and none of those are the ground truth, but they're much closer. So well, if anybody wants to chat afterwards, please come up and uh, join me. But thank you again for your attention. Appreciate it.